Hello, hi. Welcome again. So this is the second part for my lecture of threat and conservation of biodiversity. So for this part, we are only concerned about the conservation of biodiversity. So in conservation, there are actually two kind of action that need to be taken into account which are rehabilitation and also protection. We an aim to prevent the plant and animal from their extinction. So all of this conservation, we have fulfilled in biology as what we call conservation biology. And this field actually emphasize on studying the ecosystem, about the niche, the role of the ecosystem, and so on. So in order to conserve the biological diversity, there are actually few tools. Tools here means uh, a way, a method, an approach that can be used to protect for the biodiversity. So the first one is political advocacy. Second, expanding the knowledge base. Third, planning. Fourth, regulating threats. Fifth, protecting the areas. And now, uh, last one is active manipulation, which includes restoration and mitigation. So for political advocacy, this refers to the involvement of the government and also the politician in biodiversity conservation. You can take this uh, as an example of a government forming the policies and create legislation. So the government will pass the legislation and also implement the conservation program with the help of NGO, which is a non-government organization. So they both work hand to hand in order to achieve the goal, which is conserving the biodiversity. So for this political advocacy, it is important that the politician has some kind of background or knowledge on the conservation biology. Because they are the ones who could table the rules, regulation, make new rules in order to protect the biodiversity. So the second tool will be on expanding the knowledge base through education and science. So this uh, expansion of the knowledge should be targeted all the stakeholders which are the general public, the media, decision makers including uh, those in the government and also industry, NGOs and also funding agencies. So here you can see that the government is actually also needs to be put into this knowledge based expansion and you can relate it with the first tool which is the political advocacy so all these scientific tools uh, required include so you can uh, have an inventory and research maybe you have heard about this uh, an expedition being done and then they found new species or recently uh, discovered species for example so this is actually the uh, purpose of doing this inventory and also research and then monitoring in order to continuous observation of condition so the real reason why we monitor is not only just monitor and do nothing it is actually we want to reveal or observe is there any trends and also provide early warning of impending problem uh, for example is the population is getting bigger or getting smaller or there have been no changes throughout the years so these are part of the monitoring program so the next tool is actually you need to uh, have some kind of information transfer the thing that you have from your inventory from your scientific project expedition you have to share it you have to transfer the knowledge the information and this can be in many ways you can do some writings you can do a media uh, you can even do like a conference or symposium for you to transfer the knowledge from what you study to uh, the other people and 
I think we have learned about how fast uh, the science and technology is actually being developed. There will always be new kind of method to detect things, for example, new way to uh, identify organism, for example. So we also need training. So for this training, there will be uh, a personnel uh, or let's say a young scientist in those kind of emerging disciplines. So there should be a training. So that is why sometimes uh, there will always be a workshop. We call it this like a workshop, a seminar, and then you have to, of course, you have to pay a certain amount of money to join this. But there you will get uh, a glimpse or maybe updated to the most current way on you to, to study this. So the third tool is actually planning. And as what it suggests, it is actually better for us to plan rather than reacting okay, to the changes at all sudden. So planning, uh, we can say like expecting uh, what can be done, what could be done in the future. So there are two types of planning which can add as a powerful tool for conservation. The first one is environmental impact assessment. Uh, we always know the SEIA and the second one is actually the action plans so EIA environmental impact assessment as the name suggests is actually you establishing a scope of assessment in order to determine what could be the impact to the environment so before you start a project so usually you do this kind of EIA so they will analyze all the alternative methods, they will develop the measures to mitigate the project's impact. I know that uh, sometimes uh, development is actually inevitable. So we have uh, no way that we cannot develop ourselves. So this EIA will actually serve as a assessment how severe for the project to be conducted on. So for this action plan, uh, powerful tools for conserving biodiversity. And this action plan is actually very important okay, for a particular group of species. So action plan is very specific. And so that's why the attention can be given to the most critical problem. So in order for us to develop the action plan, it will need uh, participation and also a cooperation from scientists and also conservationists so these two kind of big group they know what are the things that could impose as a threat uh, and what to expect from that so the fourth one for the tools for conserving the biodiversity is actually regulating the threats you can always enforce the law but if you are not regulating the real reason behind the threats then it won't do any much help so regulating the threats we can always achieve this through legislation or regulation and this one is actually related to the first tool which is the political advocacy so the thing about this is that we can always limit uh, on the species exploitation uh, I think we have discussed this from the previous biodiversity introduction lecture how you can exploit or use this species from the biodiversity to our needs and remember there have been a lot of other species that yet to be explored so some example of regulatory measures uh, you can always control the traits of this uh, organism of the species through CITES Okay, and then uh, they have been a pollution control by UNCLOS and so on. Okay, for this tool, I will only concentrate on CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. So just like the Convention of Biological Diversity, so this is also an international agreement between the governments and to ensure that the international trade means uh, between countries between the government of what animal and plant does not threaten their survival and as i mentioned malaysia is very good in this kind of agreement involving 
uh, the wild fauna and flora. So for this, it came into fall in 1975 and by 2003, uh, this is the last time I checked, 164 countries had signed the treaty. So Malaysia, we are among the earliest to sign this, okay, uh, in 1977 and enforced it in 1978. So this convention, how it works is actually offering a degree of protection to more than 30,000 plant of animal and species. And how they classify or categorize this organism is based on how severe or threatened they are okay, uh, of their survival. So for example, let's say if the organism uh, is actually fell under appendix 1, meaning that the species is threatened with extinction. So the trait in the specimen of this species is permitted only in exceptional circumstances. For example, research. And I think most of the time, this is the only uh, real reason that they allow for you to export or import uh, an organism under this appendix 1. So appendix 2, uh, the, uh, as the appendix number goes higher, it shows that they are actually less severely being uh, affected. Uh, threatened with extinction but the problem could be happening if they are not controlled from now on so this is about appendix 2 and appendix 3 uh, it contains species that are protected in at least one country but then they are some other scientists parties which is some other governments or other countries for assistance in controlling the threat and this is uh, for example uh, if some uh, country have this kind of organism and it is like a national treasure okay, for the country and then they managed to found this in some other countries so the other countries might telling the countries hey we found your appendix 3 organism and further action can be taken so the two number five protected areas okay so the careful design implementation of management that can ensure continued benefit from natural areas so the principal goal for protected areas is a waste conservation I know that some of the protected areas, uh, they will charge you uh, some amount of money but they actually will go to the conservation. Uh, just like where, uh, where you go for your biology trip, uh, you go to uh, Baku National Park, Santubo National Park, Kuba National Park. So uh, other than protecting the areas, it is also served for education, recreation and also preservation. Apart all of the prevention for biological diversity, this actually offering the best long-term protection and also the preservation because this is protected by law and you cannot develop that place because it has been gazetted as a protected area. So all these protected areas is part of the conservation. Uh, we can divide it into two kind of approach. The first one is in situ and the second one is actually at situ. So in situ means the protected area is on the place itself. <coughs> so there are different categories of protected areas uh, which are managed with different objectives. So first, uh, like what we went to national parks, wildlife sanctuary, and etc. So for this at situ, uh, it is actually be, uh, conservation is actually being done outside of the area itself, meaning that uh, you take the animal or the fauna or flora uh, which is, has served you an interest for the conservation and then you create a facility for them and that is where all the conservation comes so this uh, access to conservation often attempt to save certain endangered species from extinction so you can see because human uh, interference with this is so much so we always uh, build a facilities for them. For example, we build them zoos, uh, botanical gardens, aquaria, like the one in KL. Uh, then you can do a baker nursery, DNA bank, sperm bank. This is for the animal, especially the threatened one. Uh, and for seed gene bank.
So for example, is this WWF Malayan Tiger Adoption Program? So we know that the number of Malayan Tiger is actually declining nowadays, uh, despite also many things that we have been doing for the past years. So this kind of ad adoption is actually one of the uh, mitigation that we can use. So this adoption, for example, we enable WWF Malaysia to secure funds for tiger monitoring and anti-poaching efforts. And maybe we can uh, also monitor the land use change surrounding the tiger habitats and as well as increase the awareness on the importance of tiger conservation, which can always be done through posters or activities or even a commercial on this. So I think that's the last of my lecture uh, for the threat and conservation of biodiversity. Uh, feel free to check on the assignment that has been put on ELIPS. With that, thank you.